Okay, I think we can get up uh, to a, a head start. It's um, three minutes past. Uh, we'll probably still have people um, entering our webinar room, but uh, I want to begin by welcoming everybody to this um, wonderful webinar event that we are hosting from the Center for 19th Century Studies International, uh, Scans, Databases, and Apps Teaching the 19th Century in the Digital Era with uh, Professor Vance Bird and Kit Belgum. Uh, I want to thank everybody for being here, our panelists, uh, my co-host, co-moderator, uh, Professor Marilo Masecha Mayu, and everyone who is attending. Before we begin, I just want to lay the floor of how our webinar will work. We um, have organized the event to last a maximum of two hours. We will have uh, our invited professors speak to us today about teaching how they teach the 19th century for about uh, an hour. And then for the second hour, we will have our Q&A, which is obviously one of the most uh, also enriching part of being able to organize this virtual lab. For people who are attending, we will have the Q&A via uh, both microphone and camera and via the Q&A uh, that you can find in the bottom part of your Zoom window. The Q&A has questions that you can post as our speakers are um, presenting and either we can help them uh, answer them if they have to do with kind of logistics or once they have finished presenting they can also help us come in into the into the chat room and answer maybe specific questions for either of them. Uh, Professor Marido will also be monitor monitoring these questions and then we can also have uh, open oral visual uh, questions. You can raise your hand through the reaction button on the bottom part of the Zoom uh, chat on the, the lower part of the Zoom webinar. You can raise your hand and in order obviously of appearance, I will, uh, when we come into the question and answers, I will open uh, your microphone and I will also ask if you want me to open um, your camera. Uh, so that you can uh, open your questions and speak directly to our participants. We are hoping to fit in, obviously, as many questions as we can so that we can make this a really fascinating space. If we don't have time for all of your questions, part of what we are trying to do with these virtual labs is for people to connect and be able to continue conversations uh, past the webinar. So you will be more than welcome to obviously send uh, Professor Bird and Professor Belgum uh, emails or um, exchanges and any other uh, type of, I don't know, intellectual, fascinating, dynamic conversations that will hopefully come from this, um, from this room. So thank you all for being here. Uh, I will let my colleague, uh, Professor Masecha Mayu, give uh, our introductions and let us know what it is that we're going to be listening to today. Thank you. Thanks very much, Veronica. Good morning or good afternoon or perhaps good evening to you all. Uh, Veronica, Uribe and I are therefore truly happy to welcome you to this new session of CNCS as you may know, the Center for 19th Century Studies International, now known as CNCSI, developed from the Center for 19th Century Studies founded in 2013 by Professor Bennett Zahn at the University of Durham. CNCSI now uh, gathers a consortium of universities in the independent research organizations and professional societies from around the world, which are all interested in long 19th century studies. This innovative network aims to promote international collaboration to advance interdisciplinary studies in
I think we did we lose Marilo? Informal Pete, can you hear Marilo or is it me? No. No, 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 no. no. Okay. Um, okay. These are the things with our internet connections. Okay, so oh, let me no, that's okay. So I will go ahead and um and start presenting. So I will um again give you the introduction to uh welcoming you to our CNCSI ritual lab. Um and let me We will ha we are having today uh, Professor Kit Belgum, Associate Professor in the Department of Germanic Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. Her research examines a range of 19th century genres and print media, including realist novels, encyclopedias, illustrated serials, and geographic magazines. She is author of Popularizing the Nation, Audience, Representation, and the Production of Identity in Die Gartenlaub, 1853-1900, and with Vance Bird, co-edited Before Photography, German Visual Culture in the 19th Century. She is currently completing a monograph entitled How the World Shrank, Geographical Curiosity and German Print Media in the 19th um, Century. Professor Vance Bird is a Presidential Associate Professor of Germanic Languages and Literature at the University of Pennsylvania, where he holds a secondary appointment in history of art. His teaching and research focus on German literature, visual culture, and print culture in the 19th century. His first book, A Pedagogy of Observation, 19th Century Panoramas, German Literature and Reading Culture, appeared with Bucknell University Press, and he is working on a second monograph, Listening to Panoramas, Sonic and Visual Cultures of Commemoration. Um, welcome, Professor Bird and Professor Belgum. Thank you for being here again, for sharing uh, this, this knowledge with us. Those of us who teach the 19th century are obviously very excited to learn from you and from your experience. Great, so I guess I'm gonna go first and I will um, share my screen um, if it's not visible. And just let me know if um, if you can see it. Okay, great, wonderful. Well, um, thank you, Veronica and, and Marie Laure. Um, although I, I hope she can hear us uh, for this invitation. I, I want to thank Vance for including me um, uh, and asking me to co-present with him. This is a real honor. We've done some other things together, and this is this is like a nice um, addition to that list. Uh, I am going to talk a little bit more about um, using digital tools, scans, apps, and databases um, in our division of labor. I think Vance is going to talk a little bit more about the application of that to teaching, but I think the applications um, of some of my things will be pretty apparent, um, how they can um, help us introduce students to new ways of looking at the 19th century. Um, although that's not my focus, I have not yet taught this uh, specifically in, in courses. So um, I wanna just uh, talk about these new tools uh, since the focus here is on uh, digital access to the 19th century. And I'm gonna use an example from visual culture, but there are I think plenty of examples from textual culture that could also um, be relevant. This is just the one that's uh, near and dear to my heart. And the one that really got me into exploring lots of different uh, ways of understanding 19th century culture. Um, there are wonderful opportunities of both finding text, searching text, um, understanding and exploring text. But I also want to point out a couple ways in which we have to be uh, cautious about uh, kind of jumping full on into uh, digital approaches to doing 19th century culture. Um, there are some caveats that I'll mention along the way. Um, 
so the one thing that I think is interesting and um, is that uh, using these new tools, we actually have access to 19th century culture that the contemporaries of this culture themselves didn't have. And I think that's one thing to keep reminding students about. We always need to know that we are looking at culture from a different historical vantage point, but this actually ramps up that, that difference, the difference we have in, in access and looking. Um, and uh, so the example I'm gonna pick today, or I'm just gonna present to you and how I first, um, entered the, this kind of uh, deep dive into the digital is an illustrated uh, serial from the 1830s. And um, it's part of my interest, um, as Veronica mentioned, in looking at how the world uh, shrank in the 19th century, uh, because the, the, the interest I have in this project is, um, is, is how these images actually even got to be. This, this is a work um, a a um, serial that started in 1833 by a relatively new publisher, um, Carl Josef Meyer. And um, he ended up publishing these uh, works in parts. There were four steel engravings in each part that um, one could purchase. And um, each steel engraving was accompanied by one to four pages of text, but the emphasis here is on the steel engravings um, because they're the ones that really showed readers, showed consumers the world in a way that uh, they were never able to see it prior to this. Um, I was so curious though about how this um, relatively provincial publisher in Germany could get access to all these engravings, all these images, uh, from around the world. And he basically um, did have access. He, he would, over the course of 25 years and about a thousand engravings that he was able to um, produce or reproduce, um, he showed every place from Le Havre to Constantinople to the Taj Mahal and uh, Niagara Falls in uh, upstate New York. So um, this was, for me, kind of uh, astonishing. Uh, and so the way I went about um, trying to recover or, or explore his access was to um, to trace these images, um, to understand exactly um, what his sources were or how he could manage to present images that are historically very accurate and therefore clearly based on um, the, uh, the presence of an on-site sketch artist. Um, so I think one thing that we have to talk to students about is asking how technology has changed and how the presentation of new material can open up new questions for us as, as research is about it. So the, um, the individual engravings, and this is something I think was interesting, even though it came in parts, um, often were removed from the sources. And this ended up being one of my new um, ways of researching this material. Uh, and that is the kinds of material that one can see online. Uh, and these are not libraries uh, catalogs. These are not standard databases. But one can actually look and get a lot of information about sources by using um, things such as uh, works for sale on eBay or um, at, at antiquarian book dealers. There are, of course, and one has to always be careful of this, and I tell students, um, when buying older works or looking at older works, sometimes what you're getting actually is a facsimile. So that is one thing to be, to be cautious about. So with all this material, I was curious how um, Meyer actually presented the world, how the world shrank, how he was able to do this. Um, and this, I think, is the, it's important to start out with a research question. Um, and that was, how do you go from, from these um, quarto, oblong uh, volumes that people could compile um, and that some libraries contain um, to, uh, to getting access to 25 years worth, or at least multiple years worth? And um, these are uh, sources, obviously, that we have access to in, um, in North America, and I'd be really interested in the um, Q&A to hear from others located in different places of the world how complete or how um, 
easy it is to access something like Hathi Trust um, sources in the 19th century, things that are no longer in copyright. Um, according to their, um, their statement uh, and their use uh, statement on, online, it basically says it is internationally available, but I, I'd be curious to hear what other people's experiences are. Um, some of those versions, and I used scans, that's kind of the first part of um, what I explained to students is you can get access to so many more things than you could um, before the digital era, obviously, and direct access. But um, there are also um, lots of catalogs and access points in other research libraries. And I think sometimes, uh, depending on the culture that one's looking at, that sometimes is even um, a more useful source. And, and this is something students often don't, don't know. Um, the, the question though is, um, even when you get access, and this means you can have, um, you can compare and contrast uh, works side by side, you can look at an entire volume that you maybe wouldn't have access to in one particular library, using digital copies really gives one a completely different approach to, to doing kinds of comparisons. But there are also problems because often uh, digital copies are not, incom not complete, uh, the quality isn't great, but um, scans, uh, or I'm sorry, the engravings might have been removed from individual copies. Um, and that's what you see here with my, my blank for the Washington Capitol. Um, so that, that trips up the researcher, that trips up the student who's actually looking for, uh, for the sources and trying, and trying to do comparisons. So that's, that's something to think about. Um, I was able to assemble my own um, library, so to speak. But as you see here, a number of these volumes, I had to make a note, were missing images. Uh, and so that's that um, digital access, while it really amplifies the amount of access we can get, is not flawless. It's not um, it's not without its 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 troubling concerns. Um, and then the other concern I, I raised to students, and that is the issue of quality. Um, that one has to also keep in mind that scans are only as good as the person who scanned them, the quality of the machine upon which it's scanned, the, um, the resolution at which it's scanned, and sometimes one gets these very strange uh, colors that were not in the original. And so in doing 19th century work using digital technology, it's important for students to understand that, um, that there are caveats, that, that sometimes things are not going to be as useful as, as direct access to the print material if we're talking about print culture. Um, for instance, just even trying to see the attributions in, in a scan is nearly impossible in some cases uh, based on resolution. So um, the, the second tool that I discovered and that I, I love uh, sharing with students because they don't um, often know about it surprisingly is how to find out where uh, images came from or if images are based on other images that uh, pre-existed. The tool that I started using is a reverse image search engine. And, um, and there, I think it's important for students to think about the various quality, the, the variety of material or resources that they have. So um, Google is one, and I just wanna show you uh, how inaccurate sometimes these resources can be, and students need to keep that in mind. This helps not at all. Basically, um, in 2018, it, it determined that the image that I had uploaded from one of these scans um, was a painting, which it was not. It's an engraving. Um, I, they get a little better. Um, in 2020, an example um, of Eaton Hall from Myers Universe, Universum basically shows similar coloring and, and a number of other engravings, but it also includes some photographs, which um, are a little bit red herrings. Um, Google uh, reverse image search has gotten better. And so one that I just did a couple of weeks ago really um, did identify one, but it also identified a lot of um, images that were not actually that close. So um, if you wanna find something very specific, you need to find the right tool. And I was able to find a really excellent reverse image search engine, and that is called TinEye. Um, and so telling students that um, they shouldn't just be satisfied with the first uh, tool they find, I think is really important part of, of this lesson. Um, so as you see here, uh, TinEye, this TinEye search basically um, in 2018 already found um, a, an exact match. Um, and it also, and I'll get to this, found 
the source of that match. So for using these kinds of uh, tools, you're able to actually reconstruct where Meyer got his uh, images from. Uh, interesting here in 2018, there's one result, uh, but if you um, if you were to do that search today, you'd actually get 16 results. And uh, the lesson there, I think, for students is that not only are these uh, tools amazing, but they change by day by day. So they they improve. Uh, they're improving quite rapidly. Um, and if you see, um, this is. 16 billion, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 12 billion images searched in 0.6 seconds. And um, and if you do that, you know, six years later, you get 65 billion images searched in about the same amount of time. So a radical improvement, but it, it basically just means one has to keep up with what the latest developments are. Um, once I was able to find these, um, some of the original, um, provenance of some of these images um, using a search engine, that wasn't the end of the story. Um, and one thing message for students is often they're gonna be combining a number of different search tools, a number of different um, digital applications in the very same project. Uh, and so uh, one way I would have to um, find out if, if for instance, just the name Tomlinson had shown up, is what exactly the vet, the um, source was, what exactly the publication was, where that image first appeared. And for that, I used um, something that, again, again, I'd be curious if this is available widely internationally, um, but here WorldCat is um, a, a wonderful tool for, for entering names of authors, names of uh, partial names of titles, uh, publishers, years of publication, and being able to then find the actual um, print publication, um, but using in, using research libraries like the the Berlin State Library or the library um, the British Library um, can be really useful for that kind of um, step as well in the search process. So um, just to show you kind of what the results were um, on the top, you have the example from Myers Universum, and the bottom you have the example from Tomlinson's. Views of the Rhine that was published a year earlier. Um, the other thing that um, I've not taken students into the lab, but uh, often it's important to look at these things under um, mag magnification in order to make comparisons. That's kind of a fun part of my job. But here, just with the shape of that little um, tree or the little um, stunted tree, you can even see that this is a work that's been re-engraved and not something that was simply printed off the same plate. And for me and for my puzzle in this project, that was really important, that this was not the one publisher providing another publisher their plates for reprinting uh, more engraved images, but it was actually a publisher re-engraving images from, from another book, um, which, was some, which is the technology that was available at the time. Um, yeah, the, uh, the last thing I wanna just um, mention is that um, it, it's not only kind of, you know, going back and finding um, the initial work. Uh, here's another example. Um, this is for Vance since he's um, from Philadelphia um, of an American work that, um, that was a, an important source for Meyer in, in composing his illustrated serial um, but you can also find, uh, and then this is what Meyer did with it, uh, you can see that he even renames it uh, very differently, um, changes it a little bit. You can see that uh, it's cropped slightly differently on the left-hand side, but that Meyer continues uh, to use it. And sometimes these things um, take on a, a, a later life. So Meyer not only produced this work in Germany, uh, but he also uh, produced international versions of it in Swedish, in Hungarian, in Polish. Um, as you can maybe imagine, the only place he didn't uh, publish this, he did publish it in North America in various iterations, sometimes in German uh, and then sometimes in an English translation. Uh, the only place he did not try to publish it, of course, was in the UK because this is where um, most of his material came from books that had been published in the UK, something that historians had not found. So um, it doesn't have to end just with the, uh, the initial source, but sometimes this kind of searching can take you into uh, lots of uh, interesting directions. 
and can explain to you um, kind of the, the longer life, the long-term afterlife of texts that get produced in the 19th century. So the, um, I think the important thing here is that um, these digital tools really provide students with lots of new ways to understand the 19th century. Um, I'm looking at visual culture here predominantly, and that kind of has determined the, the types of um, tools that might be relevant and useful. But definitely this works um, using the large databases. One can do word searches. Uh, recently, I was looking for um, the extent to which the, a German realist author, Tero Fontana, has um, talked about photography. And now using something like Hati Trust, uh, you can do individual word, word searches in 19th century texts, which is a fantastic opportunity for, for undergraduates to start looking at texts from a completely different way. Um, yeah, I think that's all I have to share, but I just, um, uh, the digital tools are amazing. They're often used in combination, which is I think the thing that is, is important for students to understand that this is not a, a one tool for one job, but, um, but multiple kinds of tools, but also that there are caveats. Um, I would not advise students ever to look at 19th century works with uh, print material, for instance, without ever having at least one example um, of a print work um, in their hands and available to look at. So one thing I think we should emphasize for students is that um, it doesn't completely replace the uh, the ways in which we have historically worked with 19th century materials. And it, it's uh, that kind of comparison between what you can see um, when you have a work in your hand versus what you can see digitally is important to keep in mind. So I think with that, I will pass it on to Vance and I will stop Thank sharing. Thank you, Kit. Thank you, Kit. This is fascinating. Nothing like the real deal. So um, Vance, um, please go ahead. The floor is yours. Uh, your microphone is muted. Oh, yeah. So Veronica and Hilo, uh, thank you for the invitation. And thanks also to Kit for joining the conversation. I'm really looking forward to the discussion. And I'm not going to share my screen. I'm just going to give some comments for about 15 minutes or so. And if I were to give my comments a title, it might be from television to paper to digital and back. And I'm gonna start my comments with something maybe a little personal, a little autobiographical, and then I'm gonna end with some practical um, matters. And so now I'm gonna begin. When I think about teaching and conducting research on the 19th century in a digital era, the title of our session. I cannot help but ask myself when the digital era in German studies actually began for me. I first began learning German nearly 30 years ago in high school. Then, and perhaps even more so now, schools in the United States cannot afford to hire full-time teaching staff for some German classes. For students like me, who were interested in foreign languages, the school system offered so-called distance learning. Harry and Hilde Wollaut, two professors at Oklahoma State University, taught young people in high school across the country German. This meant in practical terms, we watched their 50-minute recorded television broadcast on Mondays and Wednesdays, which was followed up with computer-based grammar, grammar exercises and small group conversations on Tuesdays and Thursdays over our classroom's dial-in speakerphone. This program was an excellent 1990s digital solution for me and my four other classmates in suburban Atlanta. 
And I believe we learned a great deal about German language, history, and popular culture during the Volot's engaging lessons. Looking back on these two years of satellite German instruction, I readily admit that I was much better at writing and listening comprehension than at speaking. Nonetheless, these class sessions helped establish a tight knit cohort of learners whose interest in language learning was sustained until we had the opportunity to continue studying German in the classroom or perhaps even go abroad on an exchange program. This is one of my first points. I'm really interested in teaching visual culture, print culture, and 19th century on how cohort-based collaborative learning in archival and digital settings can be a bridge to more advanced forms of research, more advanced forms of engagement. Even though these first steps may be highly mediated, um, artificial in certain ways, um, as Kit brought up, we are able to see and examine materials uh, from the 19th century in a much more concentrated manner than the contemporaries were. Um, this type, this moment of collaboration and examination is nonetheless incredibly valuable. I continue on. When I did study German as an undergraduate, so after high school now, and then continued on to graduate school, I primarily engaged with German texts on paper. I went to the campus bookstore and bought a stack of affordable yellow Reklam editions of classic literature, or I went downtown to the copy shop to purchase a bound course reader. A sense of interactivity with material texts, I, I would say, has in large part been, has disappeared or has been displaced on US American college campuses due to online course platforms since then. And when I look back on how I interacted with 19th century texts, when I was still a graduate student, I was already moving between media, um, moving from paper to something digital-like, maybe not as fancy as some of the tools that Kit was showing us. I did not realize at the time, but I was already a beneficiary of early journal and periodical digitization projects in Germany. I was in graduate school um, around the, a type of turning point in which German research council groups large research libraries and archives were beginning to digitize their collections. What did this look like in my case? I was a graduate student working on a dissertation on panoramas and literature. So I was writing a dissertation about a medium that largely doesn't exist anymore, but where you had to work with ephemeral materials, newspaper reviews, its transmission into literature, um, to find what this experience was like. And when I worked, I searched for materials in microfilm where I worked with a thick three volume analytical bibliography that Doris Kulis had prepared. And I had articles to these, and I had access to these articles about the first panoramas in Germany, but I was still trying to work to construct something of what the essence was of the 19th century experience. With this microfilm, microform, these black and white images, I did not have the sense of the size, the color, the physicality of the periodical I was reading or the literary text, nor the meanings present when you examine this, this rich heterogeneous material, perhaps in a popular attraction. I wasn't thinking about this, the adjacencies, the people in entertainments, the roles at seriality, advertisements, etc. Other sounds were playing. In working with microform, I skipped working with prints. I also skipped as a graduate student with working directly with the archive. Kit pointed to it in her presentation 
but I also wasn't acquiring texts or thinking about the acquisition of texts at this point. Um, I didn't use Happy Trust or the Internet Archive or even Google Books. However, over the time, the availability of digital resources um, made it necessary for me to learn how to move back and forth between many of these media, print and digital, and to gain an understanding of how panoramas work, but also how periodical literature functioned, how 19, the 19th century literary system um, functioned. And I think that when I look at my current research project, um, so I'm writing a book now called Listening to Panoramas. And in this book, I'm going to be arguing that commemoration is something that we shouldn't think of only in terms of markers or common soldier monuments or equestrian statues. But I want us to think about the panorama. So this large painting that surrounds you that gave us a way of imagining and, immerse and immersing ourselves in history and stories about natural and urban landscapes, about battle scenes um, that they help us remember. Uh, up until today, and that this these media are part of a longer genealogy extending to the present, just like television shows, living history museums, and other performances that expand upon the meaning of the past. And when I'm looking at these materials, and when I'm looking at the panorama, I'm often looking for the remnants of this medium. I'm looking for panorama keys, guidebooks, articles in newspapers and magazines, information about live performances. I'm traveling to find audio recordings of lectures, short films, audio guides produced by museums, political speeches given by, um, by locals, veterans, um, also fundraising campaigns to try to keep the medium around, but also the memory of the past and specifically of the American Civil War around. And a lot of these materials are kept in digital formats and, um, and they help us understand how panoramas have been invented and reinvented, how stories about the past have been retold since the 19th century. So when I'm trying to connect my research to my teaching, I want my students to gain a sense of how printed materials um, also have a way of telling us something about interactivity in the past, about performance culture, about reading culture in the past. And when I'm making a course, whether it's a course on panoramas, on forestry, um, print matters, I'll talk about a little bit now, I try to do a couple of things. One, I try to put together materials from a variety of source types. I try to include scans in the original publication format at times. So if a story appeared first in a periodical, I'll include this. This means also engaging with different typeface, um, going to a digitization project. I'll often have multiple versions of a text for them to work with. Um, I'll also will at times acquire printed versions or visit the library to make sure that we have different materialities to examine when looking at the text as well as adaptations, et cetera. I try to mirror in class the many different ways that text can appear and also the many different ways that they can engage with text, both in print as well as on screen and digital. And as I'm doing these things, I acknowledge that reading 19th century texts in the digital or in the print is not necessarily something that's easy for students. I also acknowledge that students are very savvy and that they have their own ways of developing sophisticated reading strategies that often include the digital. This means 
when I assign a text by Albert Stifter, for example, um, or a text by Hoffman, they might find online an audiobook version. They might find a modernized version. They might find a translation. Um, they might find alternative formats. Um, there might be a video on YouTube or a type of comics version they might read in parallel with the original German. These are also ways, also materials that I can bring back into the class so that there are multiple formats or different forms of engagement with the content in order for them to make a way into the subject matter. It's not necessarily easy to read, um, but I also try not to um, make assumptions about familiarity of students with the library or with the digital sources that are in libraries. Um, I try to not assume that students have been to the stack to look for physical copies, that they haven't necessarily been to special collections. But I also try not to assume that they would know how to take a preliminary step of using an online catalog to use a finding aid to work with digital collections um, that are part of a library. That is, I think that dedicating time in class with collaborators from the library um, is one way of making the digital and the print more accessible. Um, for students interested or taking um, a course on a 19th century topic. Another way or reason I turn to the digital when teaching the 19th century relates to making. I believe that one way for students to understand print culture, visual culture, is for them to have in-class demonstrations of processes, but also to see videos, which are often online, uh, of how paper is made, marbling is made, how certain relief processes are done, um, how etching, so that they will have um, a sense of not only the materials involved, the labor involved, but also by making it themselves will have, once again, a better sense of what use was like as students. This means um, I have to collaborate with curators. And this also means that I collaborate with people in studio art. I've once talked with someone from uh, the studio art department who has an MFA, who's a printmaker, and it was extremely useful for them to be able to have someone who has a, high, a much higher level of mastery than I do for theorizing, but also understanding in practical terms um, what the history of print is about. At the same time, as the hands-on in our class, we also had the digital. That is, we introduced digital humanities projects of the Nuremberg Chronicles. And then we also would go to see an addition to the library, but we would also make a woodcut. And so that they would see various forms of the processes or that, um, we would bind books and then examine bindings. Um, in the panorama course, we would have people doing mural arts. We would also go to the Metropolitan Museum, but we would also look at online digital projects that explore the panoramic, recreate this form digitally um, that are hosted by institutions like the Getty. Um, to wind down, another, I guess, way of engagement that might have a higher threshold for students dealing with the 19th century, where there's an interaction between and digital, their own interactivity and more digital interactivity involves handwriting. When I'm teaching, um, I once again don't make it a problem. It's just the fact that many of the texts that students are reading in the 18th and 19th century look different. 
um, the fonts, the typefaces are different. Handwriting is different than contemporary handwriting. And that uh, taking time to both say in class, this is how you form a letter on the board, giving students a quill, having them draw letters, but also pointing out resources for their own more in-depth learning if they need to do this for an advanced research project, but also that there are collaborative online digital resources. Um, for example, there's an artificial intelligence source called Transcribos, where paleography, where you can upload letters and they can be transcribed. I don't point them to an artificial intelligence handwriting resource alone. I try to say, these are how the letters are formed. In part because if you know how to write the letters, you understand how to read them better. But also when you use AI tools, there are limitations, there are mistakes, and you have to have some sense of what isn't being transcribed correctly at this point as artificial intelligence um, software platforms are improving. In any case, um, and to wind down my comments, I try when I'm thinking about teaching the 19th century is to show students that having a repertoire, being able to move between the print and more ephemeral, more digital forms, and that there are different affordances with different applications, with different versions of texts um, is a way of looking that is quite different than the 19th century um, users had of prints. Um, that maybe Kent would say we're having another shrinking of the world by being able to use databases and materials from Germany but that they're able to ask, I hope, different sets of questions of media that are, um, and of texts, which are in different forms and formats today. So I think that that's about what I have to say for now. Thank you, fans. Um, this is so, so complete and so much um, food for thought. Um, so I think I'll let, um, our attendees maybe raise their hands if they have uh, any questions that they might want to direct towards Professor Bird or Professor Belgum. Um, I have a couple of my own, but uh, we'll let our attendees, and I'm sure Marie Doro does too, we'll let our attendees maybe open their floor with um, questions and insights that these conversations might have brought. You can also post your questions in the Q and A, as I as I told you in the chat at the beginning. So for now, I have um, a few questions for both uh, kids and Vance, and I hope that my internet connection will not be unstable while I'm raising these questions. So first, uh, kid, could you perhaps tell us more about your book entitled? popularizing the nation, uh, audience, representation, and the production of identity in Die Gartenlaube, because I would like to know um, more about the role of the popular press in 19th century Germany um, as a source of uh, new national images. So how come that this press was so influential at the time? Yeah, I think um, I think that the press is an amazing uh, tool in general to accessing what was going on in the 19th century. It, uh, it really helps us challenge this divide between the, the popular, the mainstream, what a lot of people were reading, and then a canonical notion of what the 19th century is. Um, and that's how I've looked at it. So that um, I looked at the, the Gartenlaube, which is the... the um, a, a, kind of focus of that project was the most popular periodical in Germany in the 19th century um, with estimates uh, by 
book history scholars that maybe a million people read it, um, presuming multiple readers for each individual print copy. It, it reached a publication of like 350,000 in the 1870s. Um, the, the other other works though are fascinating. Um, so uh, I think, you know, the, the rise of illustration in general in the 19th century is something that really, um, resonates with our students today. They they understand a little bit about the plethora of images that they have access to. And I think one way we can make the 19th century more relatable to them, uh, it's not by talking about newspapers because most of my students don't read newspapers. Uh, they don't, uh, they're not familiar with that, but they're very familiar with, with um, visual images mediating uh, knowledge and information and um, and being something that people exchanged. Um, the, the thing that fascinates me about Myers Universum is the way people would take the images out of a print publication um, and use them for their own benefit, put them uh, on coffee tables or hang them on walls in frames. So um, I think that makes the 19th century also really more uh, relatable to our students. If we explain kind of as, Hans, as, as Vance was mentioning, um, the different affordances that were available to those contemporaries that we maybe have lost sight of. It seems if, if a student looks at a 19th century engraving or, or woodcut in a, a periodical magazine, um, I think their first response is, oh, that just seems so dated, it seems so old, it seems so um, stuffy in a way. But I think if one, like Vance was saying, explains to them how those were used at the time, um, and how those were incredibly innovative, right? And kind of mind blowing for, for the consumers at that time. At, for instance, Myers Universum, getting to see a picture of the pyramids uh, would have been remarkable for some in the 1830s. And, and that's exactly the same kind of transition we're going through um, with our new um, digital access to lots of images. So I, I, I think um, using kind of mainstream media magazines, um, newspapers, periodical serials is one way to, to really bring the 19th century alive for, uh, for our students in particular. Uh, it, it, it's done it for me too as a scholar, but I think um, that's, uh, that's a compelling resource for students if one can explain it and, um, and, and um, kind of uh, put it together that way. That's That being said, the, the thing I think is important to keep in mind for students because they, uh, I mean, Vance was talking about the the, diff the challenges of, of reading 19th century materials, reminding students that our view of the 19th century is impacted by the access we have through digital materials. Um, and so it's not just a matter of um, getting better access, but we also have to remember that that we then are, are citizens of the 21st century looking back at a different era. And, and one of the challenges I think is to try to reconstruct for students what contemporary usage might have looked like, um, how tactile, how, how frequently things came, how they were shared, how magazines, for instance, were posted at a central location for people to see, to whet the appetite, to kind of uh, increase uh, demand and, uh, uh, purchasing. So um, yeah, those that's kind of a lot of scattershot comments, but I, I, I love looking at the, at the more popular media. I think it's a real great window on the, on the period. Yeah. Thanks very much, Kit. And I've particularly appreciated also uh, the point you've made at the beginning when you talked about the caveats you had, because it's so important to explain to our students how difficult it is to pinpoint, to select, and to also decipher correctly all the materials they have access to on the internet. And the figures you gave were just amazing. So, um, this is also our role as uh, teachers to help them decipher the material they have access to. And Vance also uh, talked about this. So um, when you use, for instance, um, the the, ver the word pedagogy, uh, Vance, in your uh, in the title of your book, a pedagogy of observation, how do you convey that pedagogy to your students? 
So um, I'll answer this question and I'll also like to make a comment on Kit's comment. Um, in terms of pedagogy of observation, what I was describing in my book is that you enter a painting, you enter a setting in which a painting is installed that is larger than life, it seems. And you may not understand how the painting is guiding how you are viewing it. And you may also not quite understand how printed materials are helping you interpret the scene. And you have a key or you have a guide and it literally teaches you how to walk about space, how to move your eye, how to examine details through thickness of description, through things that are not described, as in, in comparisons to other paintings, comparisons to news events that are remediated within um, guidebooks or within reviews of the materials. So there's sort of a 19th century teaching you how to look. In the teaching situation, if I take the Print Matters course I mentioned, I also mentioned collaboration. Very early on, I think the second class period, we go to special collections and me and when I've taught in the past, my collaborator, we had selected 10 objects, so 10 bookish things, um, or not 10, actually it's about 20, 20 bookish things. These are going to be bookish objects the students would be writing over the course of semester a type of biography of this book. So it might be, uh, so kids brought up books in parts, and so it might be uh, a, a part of a Dickens and a blue wrapper or something. And one of the first assignments is that the students, um, not in a very systematic analytic way, but they move about the space of special collections and they find the objects that somehow attract them, that somehow pique their interest. Then they move to another object and they sit there. And then I essentially say, once you've settled upon one object, after you've looked at a couple, the first exercise is really taking 15 20 minutes of just free writing, describing without technical vocabulary, just saying, what do you see? What do you want to understand? What is an association? So essentially having an object as a form of free writing is a first way of looking, giving students permission um, to sit with an object um, and to maybe not know what to do more with it, but at least to be with it in a time where I think that where people don't do this as much. So this is one approach. Another pedagogy of observation with bookish things or print things, um, and kids and I did this ourselves when we went to the rare book schools, um, approaches the pedagogy workshop, is that you do comparative exercises. You get two editions of one book and you place them out and you give once again a student 15, 30 minutes where they are operating the object and looking at the bindings. They're looking at how illustrated or extra illustrated or whether it's thickened in some way. Is there a different illustration process? Um, is there a problem? Like, I really love this. Um, actually, with, uh, like this, the engravings she was showing where there were different sources and different um, circulations that could be determined through comparison. That's another pedagogy of observation that students can do to write a story about a text's life if it's comparative diachronic. Um, as opposed to the story of a single object where you might think about provenance, where you might do research on like who's, how did it get to our library, for example. 
um, which involves a different type of research, which can be at the same time digital. Those are two examples. To um, just um, say a word about the popular, I must admit, I was incredibly, and I still am inspired, and I still pick up kids popularizing the nation as I do my work today. Um, on the one hand, um, I work on popular media, popular entertainments, the alt tick and the sort of shows of London sort of thing. But also with Kit's book was the, was the first time I saw work with the Garten Mal, but I saw how popular illustrated periodicals could be a source for cultural studies work. Whereas in my graduate seminars, for good or bad, and this isn't too judgy, I hope, for good or bad, we worked with very fine, standardized, clean editions of texts and never really thought about the stories we were reading maybe appearing elsewhere, maybe being read completely or incompletely by people um, flipping through all kinds of other miscellaneous material. Um, and so I think that, and how this is connected, I mean, this is Anderson as well, but how it's connected to a sense of nation or identity that isn't only high um, was really important for me. And the last thing I would say about this is I agree that maybe not everyone reads newspapers anymore. But what I really love about working with newspapers is that you can once again do comparative exercises, um, often using digital resources. Um, for example, Harper's, you can search all of Harper's and you can look also at responses to Harper's. And so you can think about the type of decolonial or anti-racist work that Kara Walker does by looking at the original editions of Harper's Illustrated and then looking at Walker's um, prints or Walker's um, painted work, paper cuts. Um, along the same lines, I think that this is how I try to say to students reading Kleist and reading about um, revolutions in the Caribbean and Haiti, that there's also this circulation of periodicals um, that is contributing to this person in Berlin um, writing about, yeah, um, um, Aufstand, writing about revolution. And so, um, yeah, I'll stop there. You want to say something, Nazidal? Something else? Yeah, thank you very much for your answers, Veronica. Um, are there any questions in the chat? I don't uh, think so. No, I don't think so. But I have I have a couple also that might, might be um yeah. they're they're simple simple questions. I'm just um curious uh kind of for both of you. Um, one the, my first one comes from kids' presentation, and the second one from from Vance's. But I think um they appeal to both, and um I'm curious to know if in your evaluations and or texts that students have to write or the sort of um, yeah pedagogical evaluations that you do, if these issues and these caveats as um, Kit was explaining, do you actively or do you invite students to actively use these issues in their projects as in terms of how, how these are issues of studying the 19th century or how these issues are evidence so not just analyzing a text or analyzing a book uh, and its comparison but also the difficulties and the complexities of looking at these tools at these tools are these topics that can be actually included uh, as the project like can the project be the actual issue of trying to compare these texts or the difficulty of accessing a project or, or material that they wanted to see and in that way, also, how do you invite, kind of along that, those lines, how do you invite students to engage 
with these complexities, especially obviously the undergraduate students, when they tend to go online, sometimes for access reasons, but also for comfortable reasons and libraries don't always facilitate access to print for conservation reasons, uh, especially undergraduate and not research students. Um, and it's precisely sometimes that the access to the material real deal is difficult because they are digitalized. So we can have archives that say, uh, we won't let you look at the actual material for conservation reasons, but we have the scans, but we have the digital. So these two questions, um, how do you negotiate kind of the, the actual practical difficulty with the fact that they are a very digital um, generation and they will first go online probably before even trying to find the objects in libraries nearby um, and even access transportation, et cetera. How, how these kind of practical issues, how do you go, go about around these? So you can both, if you want. I'm, I'm gonna let Vance start with that because I think he's had a, a, a little bit more experience um, teaching this material. Um, yeah, but, but I will just say kind of in response to your very last point, uh, Veronica, that um, that um, I think one has to kind of push back against these policy issues about not getting access to uh, print materials because there is uh, digital access. Um, very often, um, I think one can one can make that case, but but like you say, sometimes uh, you know, if in in collections these things are in rare book rooms, um, and and limited access. Um, I'm I'm in a at a university that has a pretty good collection of 19th century print materials, and so there's the there's the benefit of of having things local, but um, a lot of the research that I do obviously is predicated on libraries all you know in Europe and um, throughout North America, and so it's um, that that's not something one can actually send students to. So so doing that direct comparison, but if if one can have um, just an example of uh, a print version, hard copy. Uh, and let students do that comparison just with, for instance, one one work that the instructor owns. Um, I think that's that's good enough to at least start the conversation. Um, and like Van says, if if you can take students into a, a rare book room of of an archive, that's that's a, another wonderful alternative. Yeah, but Vance has more experience with that, I think. Well, um, this is. <clears throat> I'm not sure that I will be able to get at all of this um, in a systematic way, but um, I'll address some of the points you raised, Veronica. One, um, something I need to do better the next time I teach a seminar I call the Panorama Experience, which asks students not only to go to our campus library, but also to the Philadelphia Museum and to the um, Historical Society of Pennsylvania or to the Free Library and to go to all of these places around the city, community archives, um, to go to these places is that I really need to plan time better so that students are not um, missing other obligations because people have other personal work, class, and sometimes I underestimate the cost for access that way by structuring an assignment where I say, what, which is what I do, as I say, go to the website of the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, register as a user, like go and make an appointment, like go and, find, and order this object and go there and look at it or two objects and then take photographs of it and another one and doing all this is this is wonderful, but it also um, my department luckily has the resources, and I didn't know this, someone had to tell me, to pay for the subway fare for students going to the location. And the next time around I'll do that. Um, in addition to thinking about the time and what the efforts actually mean. I think it's worth it um, to go to um, a place and seeing something real, but also understanding how to access it digitally when you can't. And this is what Kid brought up. I think um, another piece of the question you were asking 
was um, maybe now and then, maybe being sort of upfront about my life as a research as a researcher. That there are phases during a research project when I rely solely on digital materials. And then I might have the benefits at a different stage of being, let's say, in Madison, Wisconsin, a city with a very strong German language, 19th century, 18th century collection, where I can literally go into the stacks and pick up a bound edition and look at it without a special collection. And the first time I checked out an early 19th century periodical and took it home, I was entirely sort of going crazy because this is not what happens at many um, libraries, let's say in Germany. And so, but I had this luxury, but it was building upon a digital experience I had with the publication. And yeah. I think that also part of the cost and the difficulties of access is just saying that it is a legitimate form of research that's scalable to work with these resources, that you can go to the New York Public Library or you can work with data from there. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And then, um, well, I'm just... I'll, I'll just go on because I have I have uh, so many questions that have come up uh, by listening to you. And um, if our attendees don't have any questions, which I think um, Vans in that way also, uh, or maybe Kit also, but do you, how, how do you negotiate kind of these, what you call it kind of these special sessions where you have, you go to the uh, printmaking studio or you look at the bindings in the books or you speak about materiality how how do you negotiate when you create your syllabi uh for example in terms of contents right because we always have these classes where we want to give content and then we have these classes where we want to um maybe specifically stop and use a whole session into showing them how to actually navigate the databases or going into the um, printmaking studio or having an invited lecture because these are things that always happen um, and I think we're, we're a lot of us are speaking or, or most of my questions are coming from the undergraduate classes where you're negotiating contents that you actually want them to take with and then you have to use some sessions um, that are key for that content to actually kind of uh, be working um, in a well grain ingrained um, kind of well oiled machine. So if if you might want to speak a little bit about this, like when you're creating your programs and um, yeah, I can give a very small example. Um, I think you can't do everything in a session in a library. Um, and what do I mean by this? I think it's homework. Um, there are fantastic YouTube videos of how lithography is done. Um, there could be a longer text, an entire story involving something being replicated or illustrated in a certain way that they can read. And then when you actually have the class period, you have a very restricted subset of looking at one print or looking at lithostone plus this. Um, another thing I'll say to try to stay brief is I always feel very bad, um, but people are always very gracious who work in libraries. And I find that the more lead time that I give people working in special collections or the print study room or someone who's showing how some machine used to work or works, but works in the period, so that I can learn from them how they like to teach with their material and with their technologies and how I'm not the expert. I don't know how to leave space for them 
um, and to follow their cues, if this makes sense, and be aware of their time as well um, when I'm planning a class session. I might just add something to that, uh, Veronica. This is not an example from a 19th century course, but um, I think one way to, to be more efficient, not take up as much class time, also um, yet still guide the students, is to have a library visit, show the students a number of different, for instance, editions or translations of a work uh, from a different period. That's what I've done in classes. Um, let them see what's there, but then have those works all be on reserve and make a, a partner or a group assignment. Okay, now you need to go back, find two editions that you want to compare um, or two, two um, translations in this case. And uh, and you have to find you know one particular passage that you're going to compare the translations. So so give them the general overview. Don't let them feel like they're completely left to their own devices. But then um, then put the onus on them to say now it's your turn as as an assignment as a homework assignment to um, to go back and and um, as Vance was saying really you know sit with the works and and do some of the detailed comparison. So I think there are, are ways in which one can, um, th those of course are works that then can be available on reserve in the library, not necessarily something in a rare book room. Uh, so um, it, it depends on the materials that we're talking about. And I will also endorse highly partner assignments. I think that's one of Millie Law's uh, questions from the beginning about pedagogy. I think partner looking is great. Yes, four eyes can really see more than two, so that is always that's always um, uh, fantastic, and and they get excited by looking at these things together, right? Actually, I think having a conversation of of what they're looking at. Yeah, Marilo, you wanted to say something. Yeah, I still have a couple of questions for the two of you, uh, particularly um, a question on your book, on the book that you co-edited entitled Before Photography, German Visual Culture in the 19th Century. How would you describe the main characteristics of this German visual culture before the advent of photography? So it's a very general question, but I would like yeah. to know more about the main characteristics of that particular culture. Yeah, I'm happy to start out, but I think Vance uh, will have a lot to say about this as well. Uh, the, I think the one thing that we discovered, we, we cast the net out. We had a symposium first to look for um, scholars working on visual culture before the advent or before um, things were translated or transposed into photography. Sometimes they were uh, contemporaneous with the rise of photography, but using technologies that predated photography. And I think the biggest uh, result was just the variety of um, the variety of scholarship that is um, being done, um, taking very seriously a lot of different um, techniques obviously you know the the high arts painting um but but lots of manual arts um we had a wonderful contribution um by Katrina McLeod on on um paper cutting um also Vance has already mentioned the word ephemeral some of these um some of these tools or affordances in the early 19th century or mid 19th century were were temporary. They're, they're not um, maintained. And I know he can talk about that with regard to the panoramas, things that have then kind of disappeared as, as artifacts that one has to try to reconstruct through other means. So I think the, the diversity in the range uh, was fascinating. The reason we chose to kind of delimit the project, both the symposium and the volume to the pre-photographic is I think uh, theoretically the visual arts in the late 20th and early 21st century are overwhelmed by um, mechanical reproduction. And, uh, and it seems like that was then, you know, is, is the most um, kind of attractive and the thing that, that uh, gets the most attention in terms of scholarship and theorizing um, photography, film, and, and all the, the electronic and digital media that have come since then. And we wanted to kind of highlight 
the range, the diversity, the um, the fascinating uh, variety that existed in the 19th century that is easy to lose sight of once um, our focus is just on um, mechanical reproduction of, of images. So I, I think, I don't know, Vance, what would you say? I, th I think it was the diversity of, of research topics is, is what um, impressed me the most. I think that you, especially, I really like the last point you were making about this quasi teleological or sort of hegemonic status of photography um, eclipsing everything else. Um, or like later for film, how the how the cinema somehow eclipses <laughs> lots of different media forms. And I, I agree, I did appreciate the variety of um, a richness of the media environments of the 19th century being reflected in the types of contributions that were within the volume, um, I thought was really important. Um, maybe I'll leave it there. And yeah, thank you very much. And Vance, a last question for you, because um, I would like to know more about the sonic cultures, because I'm very interested in the history of sensibilities. Uh, you know that in France, uh, Alain Corbin uh, developed that uh, school of thought. And um, in terms of methodology, how do you approach the culture of sounds, what concepts do you use and resort to to uh, describe this sonic culture of commemoration? Mm -hmm. Thank you for this question. Um, and I think we're back to a topic of hegemony again, or the dominance of the visual, um, or a way of not always providing a phenomenological account that gives all of the interests, the variety of senses that are part of being in a place. Um, and what this means for me is that when we look at prints of popular entertainments, and we try to look, but also listen, the cues that it's giving us about how people are inhabiting space, telling stories, how sounds that aren't emanating, but are somehow, their emanation is being suggested um, from a viewing situation. How this, how heat and temperature how a type of shaking, how a variety of emotions are part of the viewing experience. And for the medium I'm looking at, this means that, that after the Civil War, you had French and German and Polish painters receiving commissions for paintings in the United States to commemorate certain battles that were viewed as pivotal battles. And it somehow wasn't enough that these paintings were being made in multiples and were circulating around cities in the United States into the Americas as well, Japan as well, but that these paintings had stories as well that were being captured in the periodical press, in review culture, accounts of reactions, accounts of people saying that the cannon fire sound, the look of the cannon fire sounded deafening. So we have almost a type of, um, yeah, multiple senses being ascribed to just the one. But then importantly, you had veterans of military conflicts 
who are being hired to stand in front of the paintings and to tell their personal stories of being there, which wasn't always true, but telling stories of being there at a particular battle and how these stories were then remediated in printed guides. And over time, these instances of witnessing, which were verbal, which at times would be accompanied by musical compositions, so patriotic songs, which at times, I mean, nowadays we talk about Foley artists, but people who would try to affect intradiegetic, so the sounds inside of the painting would be performed. And once you had storage media of varying kinds, they would be introduced into the setting. What this meant in practical terms is that as recorded media or storage media evolved, as the paintings became older, as political orientations changed, there were modifications of the interpretive program based on the contemporary politics of the time that at times involved revising the materiality of the painting, so overpainting, cutting out sections, but more often involved the use of light and sound to have audiences re-evaluate historical moments from the past. Um, and so what I'm looking at are, as I said, pamphlets, lecture notes, transcriptions, but also interpretive videos before um, the use of Hollywood cinema, sort of taking paintings as backdrops and reinterpreting whether it's Gone with the Wind or whether it's um, the voice of James Earl Jones um, narrating one of these paintings in the 1970s, um, or whether it's literally the technology of projection being used on the paintings today to tell both the story of the painting, but also the story of the battle. So it's sort of a variety of regimes that are trying to recuperate um, the meaning um, that's one way of talking about it. And the sources that I use are both items I can go to the Library of Congress or to the New York Public Library website or the Free Library of Philadelphia. And they have wonderful digital collections of programs and pamphlets and advertisements and broad stuff like, where I can just download it at my leisure. And that's pretty easy. The more difficult items are, for example, I've been going to the Gettysburg National Military Park. And unfortunately, um, they don't have all the resources in the world to transfer all of the tape-based media from the mid 20th century into digital formats. And on the other hand, they are very cautious about, well, one, finding the players, so finding the actual equipment to be able to play them still, but also to allow every researcher who comes in who wants to play some magnetic tape. And so it's a sort of weird access issue where certain things somehow, not things, certain organizations want items to be digitized, but they're also very careful about the process of getting it to there. Um, you have this to a certain degree in Germany as well, that you have newspapers that are wrapped away and in, or are being preserved um, and you can't really use them, but they're not always digitized yet. Um, and it's sort of a weird space in that regard. Did I answer your question? Okay. Thank you very much, Vance. Yes, indeed. Kit, would you like to add a few words or to bounce back 
on what Dance has just explained. Yeah, my my work um doesn't address sound much, and uh, and therefore I'm uh, although although probably it should I should I should take kind of Vance's suggestions very much to heart and and look for traces of it in in the work that I'm doing. It it um I guess it's typically much more uh, book culture focused and uh, the hin history of the various um, print formats that that I'm looking at. Um, are visual, but but I guess I will I will add um, kind of an additional sense, and this this gets back to the the gaps and the the weakness of really relying on the digital, and that is the tactile, the yeah. fact that um, when someone was working with or using, buying, perusing, reading, even cutting out uh, images in nineteenth century materials, they were touching it constantly. Uh, there would be, of course sounds associated with that. But um, but I think uh, it's a danger to think of these materials as static. And definitely when they get scanned, they seem even more static than they are as living objects that are three-dimensional where one has to turn the page. And one example um, that I think you know students probably just aren't aware of, cer certain print um, affordances required, I mean, Vance mentioned um uh relief printing intaglio printing requires that when print on a separate piece of paper typically that paper is thicker in order to absorb the ink out of the grooves of the copper or steel engraving um and there's nothing on the back right so which is exactly why uh they lend themselves to being removed from the original uh work that was purchased uh, and framed and hung on a wall because there's no ink on the back. There's nothing that that shows through. Uh, we could talk about the quality of 19th century paper as something that we all um, deal with, both in the hard copies, but also in the digitized um, scans. So I think for students to realize that um, that different aspects of 19th century materials had different roles, and those different roles basically um, meant there were different formats that, that uh, for instance, a steel engraving or a copper engraving would necessarily take as opposed to a, a wood engraving, which could be printed alongside uh, letterpress in a 19th century magazine or newspaper. So um, having students think about the, the um, actual tactility of how things were used and what that means for how they appeared um, is an important lesson, and and th that's where the digital really um, fails. We we can't we can't rely on that, uh, and that's why I say this is um, all to be used um, with caveats to the students, and and that might that lesson might be translatable to to their own um, experience of say social media or using the internet, um, looking for you know, the, the origin of an image. Um, sometimes they're very savvy about this, you know, wh who, who first produced something that now is going viral and getting circulated and does that matter, right? So the, the, um, the affordances are different, I think, once we're in the digital age exclusively, the born digital age, but, um, but it, it's an important question for them to think about, right? Provenance, source, origin, um, that, that's part of the communication conversation that, that we have with our students about the 19th century and that they can they can have amongst themselves um, as experts and born digital consumers about the 21st century. And if yeah, I may follow up on Vance. and if I and if mm -hmm. I may follow up on Kit's comments and also your comments about sound, um it's a very exciting time right now where there are many more approaches than I know how to handle myself. And I'm the first to say that I was trained in maybe a somewhat traditional 18th, 19th century context using standardized and yeah, sort of easy to work with texts um, that haven't had anything cut out of them or, you know, I'm not doing any sort of genetic work. Um, I'm this sort of standard. But on the one hand, I want to try to find space to say, 
I know how to Google, but my students Google in a way that I don't. That is, even though there is the same tool, born digital people use them in a slightly different inflection I, 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 that I don't quite get, but is very effective for them. So I think that I often say, I can't be too prescriptive. If you're able to do the thing you need to do, and you use Google image search instead of the, the instead of the text search to get to the same solution, that's great. The other end of this is I readily admit that both within my field as well as in other fields, there are experts in digital humanities approaches, and I'm not one of them. And I have to rely on their expertise to give me a couple of pointers. And I think that's okay. I think that I don't have the resources to do the scale of some of their digital projects on the 19th century. So money, people, expertise, technology, I don't have this. But I think I can definitely profit from all of the wonderful work that they're doing when they make their results public um, and searchable and all of this. The final thing I'll say about being a little dilettantish or not being an expert on the highest end of the digital is that for academic publishing, there are wonderful hybrid editions where you can have sound and sight, where you can navigate unusual formats, at least visually digitally, in ways that you can't do in a normal text block. And I think that that's great. On the other end, even if it isn't really the other end, I also accept that students will have novel ways of creating digital texts that may be inspired by 18th and 19th century themes from courses. And that's okay. I know um, it wasn't me, but a colleague of mine gave an assignment where the student had to illustrate a story and the student used some type of artificial intelligence and made a very beautiful um, illustrated edition of a story. I don't know how to do this. I also don't know how to assess this, um, but I know that this is one of the ways that the digital is being used now, nowadays. And I'll stop. Thank you, Vance. Um, I know that uh, Dr. Belgum has to leave in about four minutes, but we have we have one question in the chat. I'll read it and then maybe Kit, if you want to answer very briefly, and then we'll we know that we've extended um, your very generous day, and then Vance, you might you you could um, answer this uh, after after Professor Belgum. Thank you for this amazing webinar. This is from Camilo Uribe Bota. I have two questions for both Kit and Vance. What do you think the digital experience can still achieve that it has not yet accomplished? And how do you think an archive museum or library could incorporate more of the digital into their in-person visits? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, well, as I alluded to um, in just looking at you know Google reverse search engine and and how it's changed over the course of a couple of years, I, um, it's almost impossible to answer that question. We're, we're almost um, trying to catch up with what the technology is developing uh, day by day or, or week by week. Um, so I think, uh, and, and I guess the, the thing that strikes me, and, and this makes me feel very much like a student, when I uh, first started this project on Myers Universum, um, I really didn't know what tools were out there. And I felt like it was almost hunting for needles in a haystack to find the things that were useful to me. There is no, um, to my knowledge, kind of bibliographic um, collection of the kinds of materials that are available to researchers. And maybe that would be a desideratum that we 
um, start to assemble and share. I mean, like Van says, learning from what colleagues are doing, I think is really invaluable. Um, share resources, share insights, share, share ways of using tools that other people are using in different ways. I think there's um, the, the sky's the limit really in terms of um, what might be combined to create a kind of uh, a resource manual, um, although it would be out of date, like I say, by the next day. Uh, really great suggestions about that. Um, I, I think encouraging libraries to be a little bit more open uh, to allowing uh, users, patrons to use both uh, hard copy, both print materials, as well as digital, even if the digital exists, the uh, understanding this this need for the comparison um, and the the double checking that might be that might be one suggestion, but it, it, it's a wonderful wonderful question. Thank you, Kit. Thank you for for being here with us. I think we we still have five, fifteen minutes uh, so that Vance can answer the question and then we can wrap it up. But I just wanted to um, I think on behalf of CNCSI and uh, Marie Love and I to thank you for being here. And for yeah, being so well, generous with your time, your early morning rise, the whole, the whole works. Well, thank you for including me, and again, thanks, Vance, for for extending the invitation from from both of you, and uh, and I, I look forward to the next um, webinar. So I, I I hope to um, hope to be able to uh, participate as a as a viewer. Thanks okay. very much. All right, thank you. It's been a time. pleasure to listen to you. Mm -hmm. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. Okay, Vance. So Vance. Yep. <laughs> I hate to always say that I'm not an expert, but I'm really sure that people working in museum education have really sophisticated ways of thinking about incorporating the digital into experiences. Um, if as for archives, I guess my only response would be, um, it might be a resources issue. Uh, for example, I go to a certain archive and there's this 19th century material that isn't prioritized as the best of literature. But I'm interested in it because it helps me understand the things that people actually went to see when they went to the theater. But this material is in a poor condition and there isn't enough money to digitize everything. And so if, and there's not enough physical labor to digitize everything, it takes people to do it, people being paid to do it. And I think that if it was this uh, wish, it would be maybe more digital materials that could be viewed in person in an archival setting to keep me from further deteriorating something physical that maybe was made on poor quality paper or something like this. But then also making it available for people outside of the setting to use. Um, I think there's still a lot of material that is trapped behind institutional um, paywalls. And it would, yeah. Thank you. Yes, that, that is true. There's also um, something that I was thinking about when, when I've been just listening to, to both of you is um, also the difficulties that each place and, and geographical conditions uh, in, in terms of access and resources and um, all of the resources that you've listed, right? From people to, to actual money, to actual um, possibilities of moving between geographies. There's all of these things. Um, listening to you speak about a lot of these resources, we, we um, uh, I think we all find uh, wherever it is that we are, that there's different different issues that we have to navigate to get students to museums and to get students to, um, I don't know, because sometimes 
uh, museums have uh, costs and they're not always easy to navigate. And then institutions don't always have the resources to pay for these costs or even the bureaucratical um, situations of, of uh, navigating visits and um, appointments, et cetera. So all of this has been very, very enlightening, uh, Vance. Thank you. Um, Mark, yeah, yeah. And then this is just to add one more thing to what you said. Not everyone knows how to ask to get an appointment or will be granted an appointment. Um, it's a, cult, a sophisticated Institutions cultural... also seem so hermit, her very closed, right? Institutions are kind mm -hmm. of very, also very overwhelming, right? Like the National Library, how do you even start at the National Library? And then you have institutions telling you as a, as a uh, faculty, please bring your students, please get them to come. And then students feel that there's this kind of um, blockade, I don't know, just mental blockade into going into the institution. Marilo, do you want to say um, anything to conclude and um, thank Vance and, and the people who are still with us here? Yeah, I, I would like to extend my thanks to, to Vance and once more to Kit um, for presenting um, their research and also teaching methods and also approach to these visual documents. Really many thanks to um, the two of you because it's been really a great pleasure to, um, to get in touch with you, to know you and to know more about what you're doing. And um, we were absolutely pleased. So um, Veronica, Thank you also for organizing the whole webinar format behind the scenes from your university, because um, that was also quite a thing to do. And um, it was a lot of energy too, but yeah, also much fantastic. enthusiasm for the it two of fantastic. us. Fantastic. And just to extend uh, the invitation to both, both Vance and people who are still here with us to future um, um, uh, webinars, and you can follow us on social media and the web pages of INCSA, uh, the Inter um, International 19th Century Studies Association, and the CNCSI Center for 19th Century Studies. Um, and we hope to see you very soon. We're going to have a big conference in Durham, England in July. You can also follow that through our web page. Um, and Vance, thank you. Thank you again for your time. Uh, this is very generous, obviously, into sharing those insights in terms of things that we don't always share because we usually share our research. We don't usually share how it is that we teach and the, the walls that we run into. Thank you so much for creating this forum. I do not know another of another space where I'm able to exchange with colleagues where I'm able to learn from other colleagues about pedagogical practice, and especially in our period. Um, so thank you, thank you. And I, I really am looking forward to the next occasion. Great. Have a fantastic day. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.